Amen. Well, thank, thank you, Brother Frank. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, let's pick up where we left off. And we've been talking about the armor of God, and so I want to start this afternoon by talking a little bit about the nature of the warfare between God and Satan. So let me open us in prayer and we'll, we'll jump in. Father God, thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in it. Use it in a way that would, would please you. It's in the name of Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So I realized that we're not recording this on video, so now we can walk in the <laughs> You know what, what my wife has done at home, we use this one camera and she has tape on the floor and I'm not allowed to walk outside the tape. <laughs> <laughs> it drives me crazy, but now I can do whatever I want. It's exciting. Uh, so let's talk about warfare just for a minute and, and the warfare between God and Satan. And let's start with the prophecy program and then we're going to go to the mystery program. But if you think about the prophecy program, Daniel brought something to my attention. When I said earlier the essence of all warfare is deception, that is a largely true statement, but I want to show you how that's a little bit inaccurate. If you think about the prophecy program, and let's just start in Genesis 3. When, when God curses the serpent, he tells the serpent exactly how he's going to destroy him, doesn't he? He's going to be destroyed by the seed of the woman. And, and, and Genesis 3 explains Genesis 6. Why do the sons of God take of them wives of the daughters of men? Why do they do that? They're doing that to corrupt the human seed line, right? Genesis 3, God says to the serpent, Satan, I'm going to destroy you with the seed of the woman. Satan hears that and says, thanks. You told me who to kill. Right? If he can corrupt the seed of the woman then he can prevent the Messiah from coming. When you read about Noah in Genesis, Noah was a just man and perfect in his what? Generations. Generations. Plural. He wasn't perfect in his generation in that he was the only good kid in his class. He was perfect in his generations in that his descendants were uncontaminated by the activities of the sons of God. Right? So what happens is Satan corrupts the human seed line, largely. God says, that's fine, I'll just drown them all. <laughs> Which is what he does. And then Satan tries again, when you read Genesis, it says, and also after that, that's where Goliath is from, and David takes care of him. My point is this. The way the prophecy program works, in terms of the warfare between God and Satan, there is zero deception on God's part. He says to the serpent, I'm going to destroy you, and it will be the seed of the woman. Satan responds to that by trying to corrupt the seed line. God then gives further instructions, doesn't he? He says, for example, it's going to be from the tribe of Judah, from the house of David. And what God, here's my point, what God does every single time is he says, this is how I'm going to do it. And he's specific. And in the act of doing that, what he is saying to his adversary is, you can't do anything about it. Because every single prophecy makes it harder, right? If, if, if I was writing the Old Testament with my wisdom, my wisdom isn't that great. Did, did I get in front of these or something? I don't know, maybe I was running around too much. <laughs> but think about this with me just for a minute. If you and I were writing the Old Testament and predicting things hundreds and thousands of years in advance, I'd been a lot more vague. Right? Yeah. But instead he says, it's going to be, the, 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 the Messiah will be from the tribe of Judah, from the line of David. He'll be from Bethlehem. He'll be betrayed by a friend for 30, not 29 pieces. So he does all of these conditions, right? And every single one of them makes it harder for it to be fulfilled. Because they all have to be fulfilled. And, and what he's doing is he's scripting this thing out. And he's, you know, so he's telling Satan exactly what he's going to do. Now my point in saying all that 
is that the prophecy program is a demonstration of God's power. I'm telling you exactly what I'm going to do, Satan, and there's not a thing you can do to stop it. Now let's contrast that. What is the mystery program about? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now look at verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. And then it says, even the hidden wisdom. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7 is the Bible definition of what a mystery is. A mystery is wisdom, but it's not any old kind of wisdom. What kind of wisdom is it? It's hidden wisdom. So what God did with the mystery is there is some information, some wisdom that existed that he kept secret. Now let's just read the rest of verse 7 and verse 8. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Under the prophecy program, God's victory over Satan would have demonstrated that he was more powerful. He says, I'm going to do A, B, and C. You can't stop it. God fulfills it. There's no question who's more powerful. But Richard made this point earlier. What Satan does is when Satan is a created being, when he rebels, he says, God, I'm wiser than you. I'm going to, to take your creation. I'm going to twist it to serve me. My wisdom is going to allow me to take that which you created for your benefit and make it mine. So the, 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 the essential claim of the rebellion was, I'm wise enough to take yours and make it mine. So God responds to that by doing what? He didn't even lie. He just said, one teensy little thing I'm not going to tell you. He doesn't tell it to him. In Luke 22, 3, what does Satan do? Satan enters into Judas. So right before the cross, is Satan fully in favor of the cross? Yes. Yes, he is. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. What is he on the other side of the revelation of the mystery? He's not in favor of it. That little information that was hid causes him to change his mind. Now, my personal opinion is this. You can decide for yourself. But if you think of Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and there's a rebellion in heaven and on earth, and we understand that Israel is God's vehicle to take back the earth. That in the new Jerusalem, it will be Israel in its redeemed condition. But what does God do to deal with the satanic rebellion in heavenly places? Well, his answer for that is the body of Christ. So if you think with me, and let's just think about Acts 7 or Acts 8. If you're Satan in Acts 7 or Acts 8, you would feel confident about your control of the heavens. With the earth, you understand that God has a plan to take back the earth. He wants to take back the earth under the leadership of Israel. He said that's what he wants to do. The whole Old Testament is about Satan keeping Israel in a state of idolatry so they can't be the channel of blessing to the earth that God wants them to be. So as you're Satan thinking about the warfare on earth, you have a plan. You're, you're trying to thwart Israel being the channel of blessing but you know that God wants to use them. So that one would be in doubt in your mind, right? God said he wants to do this. You know, am I really going to be able to win that? But as Satan thinks about heaven, now think about this with me. Can angels beget new angels? No. They can't. Can fallen angels be redeemed? No, they can't. Well, you're two for two. Okay, one more. After Genesis 1, did God create any new angels? No. no. Three for three. Okay, so what does that mean? If you're Satan in Acts 7, the leading powers in heavenly places have rebelled, and they are on your team. They can't be redeemed, because Christ didn't die for their sins. And God's not creating any new angels. So as you look at that, 
You say, well, hmm. The Old Testament is conspicuously silent about what God's going to do to take back the heavens. And that's because I thwarted his purpose. There's only so many angels he created. The leading ones are on my team. Christ didn't take upon himself the nature of angels. Read Hebrews 2. He took upon himself the nature of what? Amen. Men. So what's God going to do to fix this? And there was no answer. Right? There was no answer to that question until the revelation of the mystery. So in Acts 7, Satan would have had a certain confidence about his position. When the revelation of the mystery is given to Paul, sometimes, there's, at some point, there's going to be a modern version that adds the word oops. <laughs> because that's the, the first thought that Satan had, right? What did I do? When I was in favor of the cross, I was in favor of the humiliation of the Son of God, and I knew he would resurrect, but I had no idea he was going to do this absurd thing and purchase the body of Christ. Because now once the body of Christ is purchased, what does the body of Christ do to Satan's angels, fallen angels in the heavens? Replaces them, it supplants them, it eliminates the need for them. The beautiful thing, I can't help this, this is probably private interpretation, but here goes. After the body of Christ gets their new bodies and goes through the judgment seat of Christ, receives their rewards, and is given their assignments in the heavenly places. It is at that point in time that God has no use for Satan in the heavens. That's right. And so the way I picture it in my mind, this is the private interpretation, is he turns to Michael and says, get him out of here. And Michael says, yes, sir. <laughs> now, I, that's probably all false. But, but, but you know Michael has been waiting for that order for a long, long time, right? Amen. And he's finally given it, and he's able to execute on it. Yeah. Now, I tell you all that to say this. What that means, the dispensation of grace is fundamentally a time of all kinds of satanic deception as to what is going on. So let, let, me, let me build the point further. Look at 1 Timothy 3. Now, in 1 Timothy 3.16, I'm going to suggest something to you, and you can, you can decide if this is true or not. 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The traditional interpretation of that verse is the mystery of godliness is that Jesus Christ took upon himself human flesh. You can believe that if you want. I don't believe that. I don't think it's a mystery that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. There's nothing hidden about it. Right? Isn't the whole point of Isaiah 7, 14 to predict that, that there would be a virgin that would bear a child? So I don't think the incarnation was a mystery. And by the way, just read the verse. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels. Then what does it say? Preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Was Jesus Christ preached unto the Gentiles before he ascended? He wasn't. What that verse is about, God was manifest in the flesh, it's about the body of Christ. God is manifest in the flesh today through the body of Christ. In other words, what is the great mystery? Well, the, the great mystery is the church, the body of Christ. That's what 1 Timothy 3.16 says. That's what Ephesians 5 says. When, when Ephesians 5 talks about a great mystery, it's Christ in the church. So think about this with me. Satan is a copycatter, isn't, isn't he? He's a copycatter. He's a deceiver. If God has the mystery of godliness, what is Satan going to do in response? Excellent. He's going to have the mystery of iniquity. So get 2 Thessalonians 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. 
So what Paul says in, in 2 Thessalonians, early, you know, 2 Thessalonians is the third letter he writes. It's early on in his ministry. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now I personally understand that to refer to the dispensation of grace. That, that which holds back the revelation of the man of sin is the dispensation of grace itself. But what I want you to notice is this. So, in the Old Testament, when God tells Abram that he's going to give him the promised land, and then he takes Israel into Egypt for hundreds of years, what does Satan do at that point in time? Now think about it with me. Satan knows that God wants to give that land to Israel, right? Because Satan understood that God promised to Abraham. And yet, Israel is in Egypt. So what Satan does is he says, okay, Israel's not getting the land right now, but I know God's ultimate purpose is to bring them into the land. He already said that. So what does Satan do? Well, the reason why there are giants in the land, and this is post-flood, right? The reason why there are giants in the land, and the reason why there are fortified cities in the land, read Joshua and read Judges, is because what happens is, God promises Abraham, I'm going to give you the land. But he doesn't do it until over here. And Satan uses the time in between to do what? To prepare. I know what's coming, right? God is not a liar. God said he's going to bring Israel to the land. He hasn't done it yet. You know what that means? More time to prepare. I'm going to put giants in the land, and they're going to dig in. Right? They're going to fortify themselves so that when God wants to bring Israel into the land, I'll resist it. I would suggest to you the same thing is happening during the dispensation of grace. Is God going to ultimately accomplish everything that was said in the prophetic scriptures? He is. But did he put it on hold for 2,000 years? He did. So what does Satan do with that time? Does he twiddle his thumbs? Or does he have a mystery of iniquity, which is a satanic form of wisdom that is deceitful and deceptive and designed to serve his purposes? That's what he has. He has a mystery not of godliness, but a mystery of iniquity, doctrine to serve his purpose, and it was already working early in Paul's ministry. What all of that tells us is this. We, we have to grasp and we have to understand that the warfare that exists is doctrinal in nature, it's spiritual in nature, it's mental in nature, and, and it is deceptive. And if we are, if we're so cavalier to think, and by the way, let me ask you this. You know what happens? If you survey people the vast majority of people think they're better than average drivers. <laughs> right? Well, that's not mathematically possible. But what happens is in our mind is we all think we're better than an average driver, right? And we all think, yeah, there are people that are deceived. But they're not as smart as I am. Let's just be honest. That's our mindset if we're honest, right? We don't think of ourselves as being the ones that are uninformed. We don't think of ourselves as being the ones that are confused or deceived. But you know, based upon the nature of satanic deception, that it has to be influencing you in some way. Take heed lest you fall would be the idea. All right, go to Ephesians 6.13. We're not going to try to cover the rest of Ephesians 6 in terms of the armor. Ephesians 6.13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now notice again, it's a, it's a command. It's not something that's automatic. We have to take unto us the whole armor of God. Now notice that it says the whole armor of God. What makes armor effective is if it is complete. Right? If you put on a suit of armor but leave off certain parts, where is the enemy going to attack you? Obviously in those parts. So for armor to be effective, we're going to need to wear all of it to withstand in the evil day. Ephesians 6.14 
Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now keep Ephesians 6, but get 1 Thessalonians 5 for a minute. Ephesians 6 and 1 Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Now notice that there's something different about those two verses. In Ephesians 6, 14, the breastplate was righteousness. But in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, the breastplate is faith and love. So which is it? Which one of those is wrong? Well, neither can be wrong, right? So we know that. But have you ever seen someone wear... I mean, breastplates are pretty heavy. Have you ever seen someone wear two breastplates of armor? They don't. So what's going on there? Well, let's let's do this as a way to answer that question. Go back to Ephesians 6, verse 16. And above all, taking the shield of faith. Now, one of the things I used to... Many, many years ago, I was a young, young believer, and I was trying to read about the armor of God. And I, I, I read some things, and what I found to be the case is that you'd read books, and they would want to tell you all kinds of details about the shield. And they'd tell you, well, the Roman shield was shaped in this fashion, and this was the size, and this is how you used it, and so on. And... I'm just going to tell you my opinion on this, and you can decide for yourself. A lot of time is spent in what I would consider extra-biblical efforts to define the physical characteristics of things that the Bible doesn't address. So people, you know, they want to say, you know, the Roman shield was this and that and so on. And how do you know if they're right? I mean, maybe they are, but are you sure? People write lots of things that are just wrong. And so... Let me give you one example of that. Get, get Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. This one used to irritate me immensely. If you, uh, if you ever, a lot of times if you, if you read the study Bible and you read the introduction to Galatians, what they will tell you is they'll tell you when it was written and they'll say the Galatians were a very fickle people. They were double-minded. They would change their mind all the time. And they say that because Paul left Galatia and then they went back under the law. But what does verse 6 say? Look at Galatians 1.6. Does Paul say, I expected that ye are so soon removed? Or does he say, I marvel that ye are so soon removed? He marvels, which means he was surprised, which means he didn't think they were fickle. What happened is they just got doctrinally confused. My point in sharing that with you is, what people do all the time, and this is one of the dangers of study Bibles and commentaries, is they write things that are directly the opposite of what the text itself tells you. You follow me? Well, the Galatians were fickle because they left Paul, and that was well known. No, it's not well known. Paul was surprised they did it. It's an indication of how subtle and dangerous the spiritual attacks are. That's why my alarm bells go off whenever people say, well, the culture at that time was this, or the shape of the shield was this. Whenever they give me extra biblical information, in my mind, the first thing that I think is, well, how do you know that? Because the, 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 the times in the past where I've investigated this, so I've concluded you're full of baloney. So I, I try to ignore it. So that's point number one. Point number two, proper Bible study is based upon finding another verse. Right? Amen. The Scriptures cannot be broken. We are to compare spiritual things with spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2.13 Proper Bible study, Isaiah 28, is line upon line, here a little, there a little. So the, the, the proper way to think about things is to find another verse. So now let's think about the shield of faith for a minute. And you can confirm if this is true. There are no other verses that talk about the shield of faith. 
So now we've got a problem. We're told to put on the whole armor of God. One of those pieces of armor is the shield of faith. There's no other verses that talk about the shield of faith. And that's why people go to extra biblical things to explain what it is. Now, by the way, notice this. So, you look at Ephesians 6, 16. So, we saw earlier, when we compared Ephesians 6, 14 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, that there was a breastplate of righteousness, but then there was also a breastplate of faith and love. Well, Ephesians 6, 16, and above all, taking the shield of faith, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 called it the breastplate of faith. Let me show you another one. We did the breastplate of righteousness and the breastplate of faith and love. And then look with, look with me at 2 Corinthians 6.7. Second Corinthians 6, verse 7. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. So we have a shield of faith and a breastplate of, of faith. So which one is that? Then we have a, a breastplate of faith. We have a breastplate of hope and love. Breastplate of righteousness and breastplate of hope and love. And then we have a breastplate of righteousness and armor of righteousness. Did the Holy Spirit get confused in its metaphors? And the answer to that is no. But yet it uses different ones. So why does it do that? Well, what I understand to be the case is it's telling you, don't get tied up in the physics of this, whether it's a shield or a breastplate or a helmet. That's not the point because those things keep shifting. It's not the point of the physical characteristics of the armor, it is the spiritual qualities that are mentioned. Okay? So now, I want to show you what I wrote here. So get, get Ephesians 6, if you would. Now, I'm just going to go through this quickly here, but start in verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Verse 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. And so I wrote down truth there, because that's the spiritual quality. Keep reading in verse 14. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. So we have righteousness there. Verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we have peace there. Verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So what we have here is we have six different things that we're told. These qualities are things that we need to put on with regard to the armor of God. Now here's my question. As you look at these six qualities, do you notice anything about them? Is there any commonality about them? I mean, obviously they're all good things, but is there anything that sort of jumps off the page to you? Here's what I'm going to, to say that it is. What's fascinating is four of these things are specifically said to be the fruit of the Spirit. So let's see if that's true. You ready? Get Ephesians 5.9. Now when you think about the fruit of the Spirit, we all are familiar with the Galatians 5.22 and 23 passage. That's a common one. But, but it's not the only one. So look with me at Ephesians 5, verse 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So that's interesting. Truth is a fruit of the Spirit. 
And righteousness is a fruit of the Spirit. Get with me Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. And look with me at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. So, both peace and faith are the fruit of the Spirit as well. Well, what about this one? What about salvation? Look with me at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. First Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and then notice this, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. So when salvation is being described here, it's the hope of salvation. And the idea there of that, when it talks about the hope of salvation, that's not simply the... the that's not simply the justification that occurs when you believe the gospel. The, the, the reference to the hope of salvation is our, our deliverance from this wicked world. Right? right? When, when Paul talks about our blessed hope, what is he talking about? It, it, it's that hope, it's that expectation that we get to leave. Right? right. That we don't have to stay here. Well, look with me at Galatians 5.5. 5. Galatians 5.5 5. For we notice the next three words through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. How is it that we wait for the blessed hope? It's by the Spirit. Isn't that what Galatians 5.5 5 is telling us? And then of course the last one here the sword of the Spirit, I would say that that's fairly connected to the Spirit, wouldn't you? So what do we notice about the armor of God? How is the armor of God produced in your life? It's produced as a result of the Holy Spirit. Four of those things are specifically said to be the fruit of the Spirit. We wait for the hope of salvation by the Spirit, and of course the sword of the Spirit references the Spirit. If you think with me a little bit, you know, one of one of the temptations or weaknesses that the church has is, is to do things in our own strength. Right? It, it is to do things in our in our own effort, in our own will. And what we need to do is we need to walk in the spirit. And that seems to me what, what the, the armor of God is fundamentally about. Now what I want to do with the remaining time that we have is I want to talk a little bit about each one of these. So let's talk about truth first. Get John 8.32. Now while you're, while you're getting there, let, let me make this point. We're told to take unto us the whole armor of God because of the wiles of the devil. In other words, here's what that means. As a, as a member of the body of Christ, as a saved person, your eternal destiny is fixed. It can't be, can't be changed. It is resolved. But the danger you face is that Satan would like to deceive you about your condition. In other words, rather than you... So think of this, for example. Paul commands us, commands us, Rejoice evermore. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. We should be the most joyful people on earth. Are we the most joyful, or are we good at complaining? <laughs> and you know the, the sad answer to that, right? And, and, and what that means is we are failing to walk in what we could. What Satan would love to do is to have us not walk in what we can so John 8 32 
And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I realize that this is prior to the revelation of the mystery. I understand that. But there's a spiritual principle here. And you know what truth does in your life? It sets you free. I'll give you a simple example of that. The truth of right division set me free from the bonds of religious legalism and fear. One of the things that happened in my life was I was, uh, I was saved. I was reading the Bible. Didn't understand anything. Found these verses in Hebrews that look like you can lose your salvation. Bought some books, tried to figure out, explain away, make stuff up about how those verses don't really apply because I didn't want to lose my salvation. But at some level I realized, well, you know, this is like sort of, it's not like, well, what are you doing? Like, the, you know, you're, you're having to dance around things and make stuff up. This doesn't feel legitimate. And what does right division do? Hebrews is literally true word for word. It just doesn't have anything to do with us. And so, understanding the truth of the Scriptures sets you free from the deception, the bondage, the fear, the confusion that people walk in. Yes. Don't you know all kinds of church people that are worried about losing their salvation? Mm -hmm. They're scared of it. The reason they tithe, the reason they show up is because they're fearful. This, you tell me, you, this isn't true that don't believe it, but here's what happens. The typical person that comes to right division is someone that is trying to understand the truth, but they're fearful and confused. They get right division, and they're excited, and they're, they're thrilled about it. And what happens is, after six months, they realize, wait a minute, I really can do nothing, and I still go to heaven. See ya. <laughs> Doesn't that happen? It does. And what, what that tells you is before they were so careful and conscientious because they were fearful. If I don't do this, I can lose these things. But the beauty of right division is right division is just a tool, right? But, but, but the beauty of understanding God's purpose for our lives today is you're not under that bondage or any of that fear. Well, let me just say this. As, as you proceed in your Christian life on this earth, you have to keep increasing in the knowledge of the truth because Satan has fiery darts of wicked deception that wants you to move away from the truth. And they're going to keep coming. Think about this. What does Galatians 5 say about heresies? Now, it's 1 Corinthians 11, 19, excuse me. Now there must needs be heresies. Is there always going to be deception? Yes. Is there always going to be satanic attacks? There's going to be. So the only defense you have is you have to keep growing in the truth. You have to remain in God's Word. By the way, it's not a coincidence that it's Paul that tells us to rightly divide the Word of Truth. You realize understanding the Scriptures became a lot harder after Acts 9. Before Acts 9, was there any question which program you were under? There was only one. It got trickier after that. Which means that we have to be very conscientious, consistent, ongoing Bible students to have our minds renewed in the truth. Let's look at the next one. Righteousness. Now the reference to righteousness, I don't believe is simply imputed righteousness. Because if you're commanded to put on the breastplate of righteousness, it can't be the righteousness you already have because you wouldn't be commanded to put it on. But it's telling you to put on the practical righteousness of walking in the Spirit. Let me give you two examples of that. Get 2 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Now we looked at this a little earlier, but let's look at it again. 2 Corinthians 6, 3. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. You know what the adversary is waiting to do? He's waiting to find fault with whatever it is we do. He'd like nothing better than to be able to say, don't listen to Dez, don't listen to Richard, don't listen to Frank, because they're this, that, and the other. And, and anything that we do in our personal behavior that...
causes the ministry to be blamed is a mistake. It, it, it inhibits our effectiveness as ambassadors. So we need to walk in righteousness. Look with me at 1 Timothy 5.14. 1 Timothy 5, verse 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. Now notice this next part. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. If you recall in Revelation, how is Satan described? He's the accuser of the brethren. He doesn't add any value, but what does he do? He watches God's people, and then what does he do? He accuses them. He does that same thing today. Which is why we need to walk in righteousness. Get Philippians 4, verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. And we're talking here about peace. Philippians 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing. Don't be overwhelmed by anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. What verse 6 deals with it is the following, and we all have things like this. Do you ever have situations in life where you find it overwhelming? Where it's a problem and you don't know what to do about it? There's no easy answer? It, 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 I, I have things like that. So what do you do? Well, it says that you let your requests be known unto God. Can you pray about it? Yes, you can. And, and you do so with thanksgiving. One of the reasons you do so with thanksgiving is, and this is a helpful reminder to me, whatever problems bother me, they honestly don't matter that much, right? So let's say that it is unemployment, or let's say it's financial troubles, or let's say it's health troubles. Well, the bottom line at the end of the day is we're all blessed. If you're in Christ, you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You're completed in Him. You're accepted in the love, and you're going to have to be with the Lord Jesus Christ for all eternity. So whatever little thing you have doesn't make much difference, does it? It's, it's not going to amount to anything. That's why we let our requests made known with thanksgiving. But what does verse 7 say? And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What essentially we do when we pray is God, here is this thing, and I don't know what to do with it. It's too messy, it's too complicated, it's painful, I don't know how to solve it, so congratulations. Here you go. You're bigger than I am, you can do something about this. Now maybe he will, and maybe he won't, but I can nonetheless have peace, because what have I done? I've committed it into his hands, he loves me. If he wants to do something about it, great. If he doesn't, great. Either way, I'm still complete. But we need to have that peace. I would sort of suggest to you, if you've seen anything in the last two years, is that people have no peace. It's just fear, right? Fear and angst and uncertainty and worry. What, what, what dumb thing is going to happen next, right? Well, what we need to have is we need to have peace in the midst of those things. And when we have that, by, by having our relationship with God, committing things into His hand, and we can therefore have peace. The next one is faith. Well, you obviously have faith when you got saved, right? Because we're justified by faith. But there's something beyond that. Look at me at Romans 10, verse 17. Now, you've probably all committed this verse to memory. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. How do you grow your faith? You grow your faith by the Word of God, don't you? And, and look with me. Get, uh, get 2 Thessalonians 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet. Now notice this. Because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. You know what's supposed to happen to our faith? It's supposed to grow. And how much? Exceedingly. A, a verse that has meant a lot to me, Colossians 2 2, talks about the full assurance of understanding. And what, what I find happens, if you think about Ephesians 4, where it talks about those who are tossed to and fro, blown back by every wind of doctrine. The vast majority of people go through life, this is including saved people, and they're on the sea, they're on the waters, the waters are choppy, and the wind blows them all over the place. And they never have any peace, and they never have any stability, because they're just tossed to and fro. They're not established. Well, the way that you avoid that is what you do is you study the Word of God, and you study the Word of God, and you get more of the Word of God in your soul as a foundation for the storms of life. Are there problems that are going to happen in your life this next year? Yeah, I mean, you're on a sin curse earth. What, there's going to be problems. So what do you do to prepare for that? What you do to prepare for that is you get rooted, grounded, settled, established in the truth so when the storms of life come, you're already rooted. Doesn't that make sense? Amen. So what you do is you grow your faith as a self-defense mechanism against the attacks that are surely going to come. Because they're going to come. So that's faith. Hope of salvation. Look with me at Romans 8.24. Romans 8.24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? When it says there were saved by hope, here's the idea. Hope is the expectation that we won't have to deal with the problem forever. If you, if you look up the term depression, in a dictionary. And it's an interesting thing to do because depression is not a vital word. If, if you look up the word depression, you, you will find different definitions. The one that I found the most helpful is that it is sadness coupled with hopelessness. In other words, it's not just sadness. It's the idea it's never going to get any better. And for the vast majority of humanity, that's an accurate description of their life, isn't it? Unless they come to faith in Christ, of course. But if they don't do that, it's sad and it is not getting better. Well, the idea of their being saved by hope is this. The reason why Paul talks about the rapture so much is if our focus, if what you look at is the things around you, what do you see? Everything's broken. Isn't that true? Isn't your school, your community, your workplace, your neighborhood, and for certain your family reunions, aren't they all broken? They are. It's just squabbles and fighting and confusion and misery. I hope that I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. So what's the answer to that? The blessed hope. We're going to be saved. We're going to be delivered from this. And so what I need to do is instead of being focused on the minutia that's right in front of me that I probably can't fix anyway, my focus needs to be I'm going to be delivered from this. And what I need to do is I need to serve Christ until I am. So that's the hope of salvation. And then the sword of the Spirit. Look at me at 2 Peter 1.19. 2 Peter 1.19. 2 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Notice this. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now, the context of 2 Peter 1 there is they're, they're talking, Peter's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. And so Peter has this amazing experience of James and John where they see the Lord in his kingdom glory. And then after that, he typically says that they're eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy, which means we have something better. Because memory can fade and experiences are mis misconstrued. But we have a sure word of prophecy. So what does that all add up to? I'm going to suggest to you here, here's what it is. We know that we're involved in warfare, and we know that Satan has wiles. Those wiles are going to be directed against our mind. He wants to deceive us. So we have to take the whole armor of God. And when we look at that armor of God, it means we're going to have to build these qualities into our life. And how do you do that? You do that by the Spirit. It's not going to be our own strength. It's not going to be our own wisdom. But it's going to be by the Spirit. And it's going to be rooted in an understanding of the Word of God. I, I, had, I had one experience a while ago where um, I was trying to tell someone some things about right division and the, the authority of the Scriptures. And uh, the response was, well, we don't get into all that complicated stuff. And then the idea was, Hey, it sounds like this is Bible trivia, this is like minutia, you know, just random facts. And can I tell you it's the exact opposite of that? It's not, it's not just random arcane facts that have no purpose. It's, this is what God is doing today. This is how your life functions now that you are in Christ. This is now who you are and how you are to operate. And if you don't get established in those things, you will be under the, the wiles of the devil. He will trick you as to what's going on on this earth, and he'll trick you as to your position in this life. So we need to do these things that we can have the ministry God would have us to have, and that we can have the confidence of what he has given us in Christ. That's why you take us the whole armor of God. We need that as, as spiritual self-defense. So thank you for uh, enduring to the end. I, I appreciate that, and uh, love, let me close this in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that you have not only saved us, but you've, you've given us the whole armor of God, you've made it available to us. We thank you that you have given us your, your spirit as an earnest, and we thank you that you've given us the word of God. We pray, Lord, for the saints that they would just continually grow in faith, that they would take the whole armor of God unto themselves and that they would walk in, in the confidence and the certitude and, the, and the, the peace and the joy that you want them to. We give you all the glory.